Well, as uh, Sterling shared a moment ago, my name is Andrew, and he put a little too much hype on the British accent, so it's not that impressive at all. And in fact, even though it sounds really good to begin with, probably by the end of the sermon, you'll be asking, what did he just say about that? So it works for a little bit, but not for too long. Uh, But uh, my wife and I, Janae, we've been here at the church for about the last two years. Uh, I just came on staff at the start of this year as the director of middle school. Love doing that. Love getting to spend time with a lot of your guys' kids uh, on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. So much fun getting to have a job where you just get to hang out with kids and play all kinds of games, go on all kinds of crazy trips. Uh, Tell everyone constantly it's the best job in the world. Um, And uh, you probably know some of my family as well. A few weeks ago, my son, my youngest son, Benjamin, was dedicated here at Mill Creek right before Christmas. Uh, And if you were there for that event, you remember that. Uh, My son, Ben, was the one who was behaving himself and doing everything right, other than trying to grab Sterling's face while he was being prayed for. Jonathan was the one yelling from the stage during the prayer for donuts because he could see them out the back in between picking his nose, so uh, it was quite the experience being on stage while we were doing that. Uh, But I've found ever since I became a parent, I'm constantly learning there's new levels to what it means to be a parent of kids like this, especially since we've had Ben, uh, and now we're not just playing uh, offense anymore, now we're playing defense, because we've got two of them at the same time. Uh, But the whole experience of it has just been learning one thing after another, going further and further into what it means to be a parent of these kids. And I remember the very first time we brought Jonathan, our oldest, home, uh, I was so nervous about even just holding him. The doctor tried to pass me him uh, when he was delivered, and I was like, don't trust me with a human life. I don't want that. Uh, And just going home, and it took a few weeks, but finally I started to feel comfortable about what it was like to have this baby. And then All of a sudden I realized, well, there's more to him just than just holding him and playing with him. Now I've got to work out how to feed him, how to help him when he's crying, doing all of the crazy things of parenting. And with every month that passed, I realized I need to get him to know this whole job and this whole role as a parent more and more and more. The most recent uh, exploration in parenting for me occurred when my family and I were just on a trip to England to visit my family for New Year's. And uh, there was one evening we were putting the boys in the bath together, and I noticed that Benjamin's face is getting a little red, and I'm looking, well, is the, is the bath too hot? And then sure enough, I discover the source of his red face as a small brown log floats to the surface of the water. Uh, and of course, you, those of you who are parents know how you get through an episode of a, of a poop in the bath. It's, it's through therapy. Uh, and it's a terrible experience. But... It's not just those negative things and the hard things, it's also just the joy of getting to know these little boys, getting to see their personalities emerge and getting to know them more and more, seeing the things that excite them. I love being in England and seeing my boys with my nephews for the first time. They'd never got to spend any time together. And seeing the joy on Jonathan's face as he played with his nephews and played with boys so that he could feel a part of of what they were doing because they were a lot older than him. And all of those things go to serve that being a parent, and in fact really in any relationship in your life, it is a journey of getting to know people deeper and deeper and more and more. There is never a moment in our relationships with anyone where we truly know them to where we don't need to learn anything else. There's people I've been in relationships with for my whole life, my mother, but the longer that we know each other, the more that we find out about each other, and that's what it's like with God. And in fact, as we look in Ephesians today, we're going to be looking at this lesson and this important part of following God, of getting to know him more, realizing that there is more than just an initial decision to say that we believe in something, but it's an ongoing relationship of getting to know God more and more. And I'm really excited to be in Ephesians, and I've been looking forward to this for a few weeks because I think that Ephesians is one of the most exciting and encouraging books in the whole Bible. In fact, a lot of people who've studied Ephesians will call it one of the most contemporary letters in the New Testament. And what they mean by that is that there's a lot of letters and a lot of books in the New Testament that sometimes, even though we can feel God speaking to us through them, it's hard to connect with them. We know as we read about the different situations and circumstances, this wasn't written to us. It could have been... uh, partly connected to us in some of the things that it talks about, but when we read about these different religions and these Greek gods, it's, it's hard for us to connect. But in Ephesians, it's very different because Paul doesn't talk about really specific things going on in the church at Ephesus. He just has a general encouragement about, to them about their faith, about what Christianity is all about. And we started that last week 
when we looked at verses 1 through 14, we saw Paul unpack this amazing vision of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to have come to know this Jesus in everything that he is, everything that he was, everything that he's done for us. And then when we come to verse 15 where we're picking up today, Paul kind of pauses because he's just unloaded this unbelievable amount of theology and doctrine on us. We've read about how God's adopted us before the foundations of the world, that he's redeemed us, that he has worked on our behalf to forgive us. And so he wants to take a moment to pause because Paul knows that knowing Christ involves more than just getting something in your head. Knowing Christ is more than just about reading some words in the Bible and then saying, okay, I've got it now. I could repeat to you and tell you exactly what Christians believe. Knowing Christ has a depth to it. Knowing Christ has a whole different side to it. And that's what Paul is going to open up for us today. So if you guys want to read with me, if you've got your Bibles, we're in Ephesians 1. And we're going to look at this amazing prayer where Paul prays three things for the Ephesians in their knowing Christ. He prays, first of all, that they would know the hope of their calling. Secondly, that he would know the richness of their inheritance. And thirdly, that he would know the greatest of God's power towards them. This is what he says. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So the first thing that Paul gives us is an encouragement in praying for us that we would know the hope of our calling. When I was in college, probably like most of you, the worst day in the entire semester was finals week when you were coming in and you knew you had a test that day because if you were anything like me, you weren't a really good student. You'd kind of slacked off on the front end. So you would walk into your final knowing that the entire semester rests on how well you do in that one two-hour exam. And there's so much pressure when you go in, I hated it. For example, in my very last semester at college, uh, I had been taking French for two years and I'd not done well because realistically, who does do well in French? And I was walking into that exam knowing if I didn't ace this, if I didn't do absolutely spectacularly, I hadn't done enough in the front half of the semester to get a pass. So I had to pull this through because if I didn't pass this exam, I don't pass college. I have to pay a whole extra boatload of money in order to have a college degree, which I didn't have to do. So I knew I have to get this done. And even just sitting down, even if there was questions that I felt comfortable with and I knew the answers to, just the pressure of knowing I have to get this right, I have to be perfect, was unbearable. I hated every minute of the exam. Thankfully, I did pass. But... I much preferred walking into those exams where I had done enough on the front end that walking into that exam, I knew no matter how well I do on this final, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to pass. Now, those were few and far between, but I loved being in those exams. And having the hope of our calling is similar to that. Knowing the hope of what Jesus has done for us is similar to being in a final and knowing that the ultimate outcome, the result of that day, does not rest on your shoulders. It's not, it doesn't rest on the work that you're going to perform. This is what Paul says when he prays about this. He says that he prays that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we would know the hope of our calling. There's two things I want to kind of draw out there, because that's quite a bible phrase, isn't it? Open the eyes of our hearts, that they would be enlightened. That when we say that, it sounds really poetic, but sometimes, if we're honest, we have no idea what that actually means. We don't feel any encouragement initially from that. Well, in Paul's day and in Paul's language, the heart wasn't what we typically think it of. He's not talking about knowing it emotionally. He's not saying, I pray that you would just feel emotionally this hope. He wanted to give them so much more than that because Paul knew that the gospel actually offered a hope that was far more than you just feeling hopeful. 
It was a concrete reality. See, in Paul's day, what the heart was, was the center of your being. It was this most motivational center, the very core of who you were. So whenever Paul says, God, I'm, I'm praying that you would open the eyes of their heart, that they would be enlightened, he's saying, I want you to open up the very center of who these people are. I want them to get this right in the center of who they are. And when he says that he wants them to know it, the Greek word that he used for know is this Greek word, I door. And what's unique about it is that it literally means to see, not just to know intellectually, but to see, to perceive with your senses. So Paul is saying, open them up in the very depths of who they are, that they might experience this, that it wouldn't just be something that they know up here in their head, that they quote to themselves when they wake up on a morning and they're searching for some reason to have hope in the midst of difficult circumstances. Paul is saying, God, let them see that the gospel is more than that. Let them see that the gospel is something that gives you an experience of the hope of what God has done for them. If we jump back to verses 1 through 14, let me just remind us of a couple of things that God has done for us in Jesus. It says he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He chose us before the foundation of the world. He's made us holy and blameless in his sight. We've been given redemption through his blood. We have been adopted as sons. He has lavished upon us the riches of his grace. I love that last line. I was jealous that someone else got to preach that because I could talk for an entire hour about how incredible that is, that God doesn't just extend grace to us. He doesn't just give us a little bit of a rope. He lavishes grace on us. That's who God is. He's so great towards us in his love that he lavishes grace on us. Now that is what the hope of our calling is, that that is the God who has worked on our behalf. That is the God who has come to make himself known to us. The real beauty of this prayer, I think, especially for someone like me, is that when I read this, what I'm, I'm seeing Paul saying is that it's okay as a Christian to struggle to have hope, and that's why we pray for it. For example, the Ephesians weren't a very dysfunctional church. There's often we'll read in the Bible about churches that weren't quite getting it, that Paul had to correct them or teach them or help them understand something better. But Paul starts this section by saying, I'm so thankful for your faith and love. Every time I hear about you, Ephesians, I just think about how much love you have for the saints, how much love you have for everyone around you, how much faith you have in Jesus. Those are the types of people that Paul is praying this for. So what that means for us is that it, it doesn't mean that you are a bad Christian if you feel sometimes like you don't have hope. Because obviously these people who were a world-class, stellar church, they struggled sometimes. That's why Paul is praying this for them. Because he knows the Christian life is not going to be, you make a decision one day and then never have another struggle with what you believe for the rest of your life. Paul knows they don't need to just hear it one time, they need to hear it every single day. Let me ask you guys, how many times have you prayed when you've been praying to the Lord that he would show you the hope of your calling? that he would remind you that your life doesn't rest on your shoulders, your significance doesn't rest on your shoulders, it rests on something that's already been done for you. See, hope is always anchored in something that's been done. And in the case of the Christian message, in the case of what God is telling us, it's saying our hope shouldn't be anchored in something that we need to get done in the future, it's anchored in something that's already been done for us. I can wake up on a morning and have hope because God has already done what is necessary to redeem me, to adopt me. I'm not walking into a final thinking, I better get this right. I better get this Christian life right. Otherwise, it's all over for me. I'm walking in knowing no matter what happens, whether I do good or whether I do bad, what really gives me hope is the one who's already worked on my behalf. I'm getting to walk into a final with the pressure all off of my shoulders. It's so important that we get that. That's why Paul chooses to pause, because he's told them a lot of these things in 1 through 14, but that's not enough. They need more than just words that they memorize and think. They need to pray, they need to dwell, they need the Holy Spirit to come and help them to experience this in the core of who they are. In 2009, uh, there was two homeless brothers just outside of Budapest. Uh, both of them were homeless. They didn't have a penny to their name. 
And actually, they were so poor that they were living in a cave on the outside of the city. They couldn't think of a lower situation for these two brothers. Their names were Zolt and Geza Pallati. Uh, the only way that they eked out their existence was to find junk and then try and resell that junk for whatever they could find for it. Now, one day, something happened that changed both of those brothers' life. As they were trying to make it through selling some junk one day, they were approached by some charity workers who said, we want to reach out to you because some lawyers from Germany have been calling trying to find you. We don't know what they want to talk to you about, but they've been reaching out because these lawyers have something that they need to talk to you about. Well, they couldn't think of who this could possibly be who had called the lawyers or why the lawyers would be reaching them because they were estranged from their family. They didn't do anything criminal to their knowledge, so they had no idea what was going on. So they decided to, to kind of go along with this. They followed the charity workers back to their organization. And as they get there, they get on the phone with the lawyers, and the lawyers say, uh, you have a grandmother in Germany, and she's just passed away, and she's leaving her inheritance to you. Because as part of German law, whoever the direct descendants are, whoever the surviving direct descendants are, they will automatically inherit the estate if there is no one else to inherit it. It turns out that these two men were the only surviving direct descendants of this woman. That woman's inheritance was worth over $4 billion. These two brothers went from living in a cave to being some of the wealthiest people in the world from that inheritance, from their relationship with this woman that they'd never seen. When they were interviewed about it, one of the brothers, Geza, said, we knew our mother came from a wealthy family, but she was a very difficult person and she severed ties with them and then later abandoned us and we lost touch with her and our father until she eventually died. It completely changed their world in one day because of this inheritance, because of what that was worth. And what Paul goes on to pray for after he's prayed for the hope of our calling is he prays the richness of our inheritance. This is what he prays towards the end of 18, that just as we would know experience in the core of who we are, the hope to which he has called us. He prays also that we would know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. So what is the inheritance? Because it's not $4 billion. It's actually something much, much better than that. I'll tell you what else a Christian inheritance is not. It's not that one day we might float up to a resort in the sky, in the clouds, where the instrument of choice is a harp. That's not what the Christian inheritance is. I think it's actually very, very sad whenever we think that to be a Christian, what is coming for you, what God has promised you, is simply that you will go somewhere really, really nice when you die. It's really sad because the gospel is far bigger than just what happens to us when we die. It is something that affects our lives right now. It is something that affects our lives every single day. Because the inheritance that comes to us is something that is for God and for Christ. Notice that it says in this verse, it doesn't say that we would know what are the riches of our inheritance. It says what are the riches of his inheritance, his glorious inheritance, meaning Christ, the one who has done the work, the one who deserves the inheritance. Well, the inheritance of Christ is the restoration of all things. That's what God has promised as a result of what Jesus has done. When Jesus went to the cross, it was more than just about forgiving us. It was about redeeming and restoring everything that was broken in the world. Everything that is painful, everything that is a burden, everything that has drawn the joy out of God's people, Jesus is going to restore that. Uh, at the end of the Lord of the Rings book, The Return of the King, uh, there's this really interesting conversation that goes on between the hobbits and Gandalf. Now, I will, full disclosure, I've never read the book, which I'm about to quote. So, I have seen the movie, though. Uh, but, when I came across this quote, I just thought it was such a great picture of what Christian inheritance is, what God's inheritance in the saints is. Samwise Gamgee wakes up after they've destroyed the ring and the fellowship are finally coming back together. Sam turns to Gandalf and he says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What has happened to the world? And Gandalf says, a great shadow has departed. 
And then he laughed, and the sound was like music or like water in a parched land. I want you to let some of the imagery of that quote just sit for a minute. What happens in that is very, very close to what Christian inheritance will be. It's not a fairy tale. It's a reality for us as Christians. It's an inheritance of a world in which everything sad will come untrue. A place where there will be laughter that sounds like water in a patch land or feels like water in a patch land. Where every shadow departs. Where everything painful is gone. There are no tears. Where this world will be made perfect because of Jesus. It'll be a place where not just everything is made right, but everyone is drawn together in a perfect unified family. There will be no division. There will be no one less valuable than anyone else. There won't be anyone on the margins. It will be a family that includes every tribe, every tongue, every culture, every nation, every age, men and women. It'll be what we all in our hearts hope for and long for. Even those of us who would say we don't even believe in God, that's the world that we long for. Well, that world has been purchased and secured and promised to us by Jesus. That is what he is building for us right now. That is what we are heading towards. And it's applicable to us because even though that is Christ's inheritance, in his unbelievable, gracious love towards us, that is what he is inviting us to share in. Even though we didn't earn that, even though we don't deserve it, because every single one of the things that are broken in this world is usually our fault, Jesus invites us into a world that is perfect, where we are all restored, where there is no sickness and pain. And Paul prays that the Ephesians wouldn't just get that up here, it wouldn't just be something that they look forward to, a pie in the sky when they die, it's a steak on their plate while they wait, it's a joy that they can enjoy right now, If I was to take a check out of my pocket and I said, this is Bill Gates' checkbook, and I wrote on there $4 billion and Bill Gates signed off on it and I just passed it out to the first person who came up, do you think that that person would take that check and just be like, thank you, I really appreciate this check? Of course not. If you were handed $4 billion, it would change your life just as it changed the brother's life when they discovered they had that inheritance. It's not something that you just look forward to one day. Knowing that you have received an inheritance, even if you are not touching it in that moment, changes who you are. It gives you joy, such that you know every pain, every broken thing that you experience in this life is simply temporary. That's why Paul, who writes this letter and wrote most of the letters in the New Testament, despite having suffered unbelievable things, constantly talks about how much joy he has in Jesus. He says, I consider the present sufferings of this world nothing to be compared compared to what's coming for me, what's been bought for me, what Jesus has promised me. That is what he has promised you. If you trust in Jesus, that is not just something that is a possibility for you. That is an ironclad promise that God has purchased for you in Christ. Have you prayed that you would have a vision of that inheritance? that you would know it, that in the guts of who you are, in the center of who you are, that you would see it, that you would experience it, that you would taste and see that God is good. Because that is what God is promising you. That's what he was promising the Ephesians. That's what Paul wants them to grasp and to wrestle with. How are we all going to leave this place this morning in light of that, that that is what awaits us, that that is what God has secured for us? Another story that I wanted to share with you is a story of a boy called Tanner, who in 2010 lost his father in a tragic accident. Tanner's father was a Weld County Sheriff's deputy, and on one evening he was chasing a car thief, and when he finally caught up with this thief and managed to get a hold of him, the thief pulled a gun on him and shot him, and his dad passed away. One of the most horrible things that could ever happen to a 15-year-old boy, to lose his dad like that. And Tanner decided that in his grief, one thing that he still could have that he could hold on to was some kind of symbol of his dad. And what he decided he wanted was his dad's squad car. If he could just get his dad's squad car that his dad rode around in all these years that he had been in with his dad, he would have some connection again to the father that he'd lost. 
And just to his look, it turned up that the Dodge Charger that his dad did drive was going up for auction at a benefit for a police charity. So Tanner set to work trying to earn all the money he could, put all of his money together so that he could go to this auction and make a bid. He was hoping that he might get, he might find that car, that he could have some small symbol and some some small connection to his dad back. The night comes along that the auction's going down and he goes along, sits in the audience, there's a whole host of people from across the community and the car was valued starting at $12,500. Not a massive amount, but certainly for a 15 year old boy that was a lot. Tanner went straight in with everything that he had and placed a bid for $5,000. Well, very quickly, someone bid above that, $6,000, $7,000. Pretty close, the bid had reached the value of the car, $12,500. So Tanner turns to his mom who's with him and says, well, we tried. We tried our hardest. And they sat as the bids continue to go up. It hits $15,000, $20,000, $30,000. Until finally, the final bid that is placed is for $60,000, almost six times the value of that vehicle. And they don't know who it is. It's some rancher from the area who wanted to buy the vehicle. Well, as they are getting up to leave, all of a sudden, this rancher walks straight over, immediately after closing the bid, and drops the keys right into Tanner's hands. That rancher wanted to pay six times the value of that car because he wanted to give to Tanner that which he hoped for, that inheritance that he was longing for. The last thing that Paul kind of teases out for us and helps us to see in his prayer is the greatness of God's power. It's the longest section of his prayer, way more than what he said so far. When he's praying for the hope and the calling, he kind of gives us these brief little prayers, but then when he gets to power, he pulls the whole thing out. This is what he says, starting in verse 19. Pray that you would know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. See, hope and inheritance are powerful, amazing, beautiful things that we all need very, very badly. But the important connection that they have to power is that if you do not have power, you won't be able to have a hope or an inheritance. If you don't have the power to sustain, to acquire, to be able to purchase a hope and to hold on to an inheritance, then those two things can't possibly be encouraging for you. That is why Paul decides to draw this section out because he wants to make clear that you have a hope and you have an inheritance, not because of you, but because of the power of the God who's done these things for you because of the God who was behind verses one through 14 that we just talked about. See, Tanner was hopeful that he might get his dad's car. That was his hope. The car was also his inheritance, that which he was looking forward to having back. But he lacked the power in and of himself to be able to get it. Tanner was lacking in resources, in money. He could never have got that for himself. It was never gonna happen. But there was someone in that room who had far more resources than Tanner, someone who had far more ability and authority than Tanner had. That's who Jesus is to us, the one who is far above us, the one who is the name above all names, the one who, through whom all creation was made. He is the radiance of all of the glory of God. He is the image of the invisible God. That's who Jesus is the power of the creator in flesh. Someone whose resources are bigger, someone whose ability is greater. That's why every week you are probably gonna hear a lot of the same things because we need to constantly remind ourselves of who it is who is behind every good thing that we hear inside of a church. It's not us, it's Jesus. Paul isn't praying to a weak God. He isn't praying to some really optimistic old man in the sky who might be able to do a few things for us. 
He is praying to the one who conquered death, who walked out of his own tomb. All things are under his feet. If all things are under his feet, if he is truly the one who is above all, then we have absolutely nothing fear because his power, all of that power, the power that crushed death is toward us. The Christ who is resurrected, who is alive right now, his love and his power is towards us. Do you know what that means? Do you know what it means that he doesn't say, this God whose power is ahead of you, or this God whose power is beyond you, or this God whose power is somewhere for you to attain, waiting for you, but that he said his power is towards you. That means that ultimately the God that Paul is praying to because he is towards the Ephesians, wants to answer the prayer more than the Ephesians do. The Jesus who is speaking to these people, the Jesus who saved them, who adopted them, who loved them, he moved towards the Ephesians before they ever moved to him, before they became this amazing church that had faith and love for all the saints. Jesus loved them. Christ loved them. God is not against us, he's not ahead of us, he's not beyond us, he is towards us. Every ounce of his unimaginable power, the God who the Bible says dwells in inapproachable light is moving towards us. No matter who you are in this place this morning, no matter whether you call yourself a Christian or you've got it all together or you feel like you have hope or that you feel like you believe enough or trust enough, God is still towards you. He wants to grant you eyes to see in the depth of who you are that he is towards you with every ounce of his power. That he wants to sustain you, that he wants to hold you together. When you struggle to believe, when you wake up and you don't have hope, you can pray to God because he wants to give you hope. You can be freed to pray the prayer that Paul prays because God is for you and not against you. So what is the most powerful thing that you could ever pray for yourself or other people? It's this prayer. It's to know Christ. It's to know the hope that he has called you to. It's to know the inheritance that he has purchased, that he has given for you to share in. It's to know that his unimaginable great power is towards you and not against you. If you can know that Christ, if you can see that Christ, it will change your life. And let me assure you that God behind this prayer wants to answer it more than you do. So I encourage you. And we're going to do it this morning. We're going to pray this prayer that we would taste it, that we would see it, that we would experience the God who is for us and not against us. Would you guys pray with me? Father, thank you that your love is towards us and not against us. Thank you that you have accomplished all these things, all of these amazing things that we read in verses one through 14. Lord, let us rest in knowing that that adoption, that redemption, that forgiveness was won by you. And God, I pray that the eyes of our hearts would be opened to know it and to taste it. Father, we love you and we pray all this in your son's name, amen. Well, as uh, we are getting ready to, to close out here, um, I just want to encourage you, the prayer team is going to stick around for a little bit. There's, there's no need to rush out. And in fact, maybe we could learn something from Paul, who, after he unleashes all of this incredible doctrine and theology and this teaching, he decides to stop and pause. He doesn't rush. He says, let's pray about this. So I encourage you, if there's any part of that, if you don't know Jesus and you are wanting to start to get to know what this is all about, stay and pray, talk with someone. But to close, I don't think that I could ever offer any words quite as brilliant as Paul's. So what we're going to do is we're going to close this morning's benediction by simply praying what Paul prayed. So would you stand to pray with me as we close? Lord, this morning we pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give us a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that we may know what is the hope to which he has called us, what are the riches of his inglorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable power of his power towards us who believe. It's in the name of this Christ that we go. Amen.